God's truth is enduringly true throughout all the generations. It transcends culture. The church is always going to be an embattled people. If it's swimming with the tide, it's not being the church of Jesus Christ. Look to the past, learn from the past, because the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. China has more than 200 confirmed cases of coronavirus, it's called. The entire state of California ordered to stay at home, that's 40 California has some of the strictest policies leveled against churches. Gavin Newsom's executive order threatens jail time and a $1,000 a day fine. Government that stopping people from going to church, Dr. Fauci. When I went into the White House, when I sat in on the task force meetings, was a shocking level of gross incompetence. The mortality rate from the virus was 0.2%. You know, 99.8% survival, rather than the three or 4% mortality that the, the people are saying at the time. The culture and the understanding of the people of Grace Church has always been, not only do you obey government, but you honor government. Thousands of people in the streets, but you can't have church. The hypocrisy of letting people riot it helped us all understand one thing. This is not what they say it is. By meeting, we're testifying the government has no jurisdiction here. I was arrested and driven to a maximum security prison. The government has obviously uh, turned up the heat on churches. My daddy. <laughs> when the churches fall silent, the only religion left is the state. We needed to make a biblical statement because we always put ourselves under the authority of the Word of God. LA County threatened Pastor John MacArthur with jail time and arrest. We were going to be sued. They wanted Grace Church shut down. We wanted to go on the offensive and attack the health order as unconstitutional. This wasn't about health and safety. This was all about control and opposition to religious freedom. As the government gets more corrupt and more corrupt, snitches get rewards. Its totalitarian control has to increase. And you have to have a mask on. And as they shut down any attacks against them. This is not about freedom or personal choice. The last thing standing is going to be the church.
Okay, we are live with my two favorite people from Canada. <laughs> <laughs> How are you guys doing? We're good. Well oh, thanks. <laughs> Yeah, you had to be careful with that one because you know a lot of people in California are like, uh, let's see how we narrow it down. <laughs> the director, he's our favorite director. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's great to see you guys. You guys are vacationing. We are. Wow, what fun. Um, so uh, I guess we can get started here. So those who are uh, coming on and watching this, um, welcome to... A live stream for the Essential Church a Q and A with James Coates and Aaron Coates, um, and we're excited to be here. Uh, let me check with my team. How much longer do we do we want to continue to wait, or do we want to just start questions now? You're good because we're live everywhere. Okay. We're All right. right. Okay. Cool. Well, um, it's thanks so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. Um, and, you know, I asked you so many questions in the interview. I was like, what do I ask, you know, beyond that? Um, a lot of these I may have already asked, but um, it'll still be fun to go over them and talk about them. And the first thing I, I kind of wanted to talk about was, you know, if you were to ask me pre-2020, um if we would be suing the government and defying the government that Grace Church would be doing something like that, I would have laughed. I'm like, that's not what we do. No, we don't do stuff like that. Um, so if you would have asked me, I would I would have been like, no, that's, that's not, not, not what we do. I'm curious if you guys, um, did you ever think you'd be called to defy the government in this way? Was that ever on your mind? Where was your mindset? pre-2020. When I go back to sermons that I preached years ago, the application would get to the issue of persecution that was on the horizon, that given the hostility of our culture, that things were intensifying, and, and certainly we as far as what they were imposing and legislating in society. So I think there was a sense that which I knew battle was on the horizon. I didn't know what, what form it would take. I mean, we've often talked about the government status and stuff like that. And um, did I ever think the government would prevent? You no, know, I didn't see that, that coming. Certainly, they might order for us to sign on positions and, and make us agree to their edicts on certain even and then of course, of course we would have defied that but as far as having to meet i mean this was definitely i mean there was some nuance built into this in terms of discerning how to respond it was a, a very um clever and in city on the church and it required a great deal of theological dexterity to be able to end and, and know how to navigate it. Yeah, and so that's, you know, I'm, I'm interested in that topic, this idea of being prepared. Where were you in your preparation pre-2020 of, um, you know, knowing how to navigate this? Is that something that you learned on the fly? What, where, where were you at in your, your studies at that point concerning state and, and church? There was definitely as we complied, I mean, we knew from the outset this was this was already edgy. Come to us and tell us not to meet. The tension between Romans 13 and Hebrews 10 was felt from the And there's evidence of that because even as I addressed our congregation and in the announcements, I think the first Sunday, the pulpit, because even I got sick following the Shepherds Conference, though apparently it wasn't COVID. But, um, I, I so we knew from the outset said that there was something that had to be discerned here and and we know if you obey god but not men um but but in terms of get figuring out oh, that this was in fact government overreach i mean that took some time establishing scripturally that it required defiance 
required some effort. The way that that took place was, was I mean, certainly addressing it by preaching it, by preaching to money, but also then as we opened our doors, uh, we had some pushback congregants. And in that interaction that was predominantly over email to articulate our position and defend it uh, scripturally, and it was incredibly helpful in that process, as our own convictions were solidified and crystallizing and and that things got really difficult with the governing authorities come you know fall winter of that year yeah so i'm curious aaron you know uh james is a seminary student and thinking upon these things a lot and of course you're thinking through theolo theological things as well uh, but i'm curious you know uh, where you were at at the beginning of this all, were you really confused about what the church should do? Did you have um, a gut feeling about it? What was your thinking? Um, well, I think there's a little bit of nervousness for sure in regards to when the virus hit, like what is. Um, but I think that, you know, through my reading, through teaching my babies about church, I have read actually uh, Nate Pickwick's and Dustin Bainbridge's the American Puritans, uh, I was in, in 19, and so just seeing what was happening with them and how America was established with worship and, and, and what the government was doing to them, I, I think I had this basic idea, but again, I was doing, I, I don't think came until the summer of 2020. Um, so I think like, like everyone else, immune issues and a heart issue, and you know, if I get like this, am I going to die? And um, and that, but also um, recognizing that we can't not gather, like, and to even vacation, when we go away for vacation and we're away from them for three weeks, that's a hard thing from them. So just recognizing, oh, oh, this isn't the way that the Lord planned this to be for my own sake and using my gifts in other people's lives. Um, um, so I don't think I was really struggling. Um, yeah, I just went on a tangent there. <laughs> yeah, no, that was not um, great. Yeah, just struggling yeah. <laughs> kind of like, yeah, I, struggling kind of with like, because there are some people in the documentary, you know, Mike Riccardi shares his evolution on the matter um, and how he went from, well, we should definitely shut down and, and do what the government says to, okay, we're going to actually defy the government and here's why. And he had a process that he went through and he was even challenged from certain individuals outside um, at, from other churches. Um, and that was our elder board. Our elder board was divided, you know, and I think people look at Grace Community Church and they think that John MacArthur's just running the show, but there are 40 elders that have to be unanimous because we have that principle that we live by is our elders have to have unanimity. And they had that to close down, but that was just really, okay, we're going to temporarily do what the government says because it's a warning. I mean, you know, if the government says they're going to carpet bomb L.A. and your church is going to get hit, don't go to it. We'd be like, OK, well, yeah, I guess we'll, we won't do that. But when it becomes clear that the bombs never came, <laughs> then uh, then we're like, OK, what do we do now? And at that time, narratives were being established um, and, you know, there was division. And so guys had to, like, figure things out. And so it sounds like you had some figuring out, but it sounds like the Lord was preparing you with with how you were teaching your children and just happened to read a story dealing with persecution from the state, which is most of the persecution, honestly, that's usually the only persecution is when <laughs> it's the government because <laughs> they're the only one that has the power to do it. Um, so that looks like that was helping you, but did you have any time where you were really like, it was a little tug of war and you're like, I, I, I kind of see their point. Maybe this is true or, or it was, you know, came pretty quickly. Quickly. I think, for me, I was more willing to defy the government when it came to, some, and and I've since changed my, my my thinking on this, but more like rigidly following the and then the the understanding that by me doing that wasn't actually loving my neighbor because I was I kind of came a little bit after, but I was more willing to defy the government on a Sunday and get you know told the line during the week so that thinking came i think probably in, i'm like i forgot it we're actually i went to a friend's birthday party 
And I looked at the, I walked in and looked at them all and I'm like, I can't live like this. Like I can't, I can't just have Sunday. I need to have constant fellowship. Came a little, little bit later, but for Sunday, that, that wasn't a hard thing for me. No. Yeah. Yeah. I think for me, I, I definitely valued the church, but seeing how much my value was deficient compared to other believers. When we came back and I saw that, I was really convicted by that. And I was like, wait, I do value church, but I'm probably not valuing it as much as I should. Um, and that's something that I learned from it about myself. Um, and uh, so these lockdowns happen. Do you have any examples of how it hurt your church spiritually and or physically? You know, our church always had a really strong fellowship. And so, so I think initially, because of the social media uh, mediums that were put in place to stay connected, it's and recall any really, really devastating examples of people who were, were lockdowns. I mean, obviously, it was hard for all of us. It was challenging for each and every one of us. Um, recall anyone sort of, of, you know, falling into drug use or that kind of thing. I've said that we did have one gentleman in our church who, because our church was open, he was come to church and ultimately was saved. And he was a guy that had come to our church, was going to membership. There was a matter in his life that he had to kind of work out and wasn't ready to. And then, you know, proved he really wasn't fell back into drugs a little bit and and he had you know guys in our church that were involved in his life church would have been probably january i think 2021 and time that he ended up being saved and had our church been closed he, he wouldn't have had anywhere to go he received that, that particular sermon on that particular day and so well, there's no question in that baptisms at this point in time we we are seeing how our stand dovetail with some people coming to Christ yeah. or or them, them being awakened more devoutly with Christ. And and so, so we can definitely see, see that impact on people's lives in terms of them, them coming to Christ and, and being saved. And so every time, time, and we typically do a bunch at a time, um, uh, we're hearing this come out, and then I think it was, it was could have been Aaron. I think it was Aaron that had pointed out that, that when it comes to testimonies to to those who are still not persuaded that it was right to open the church, when you testimony in in the waters of baptism of someone saying the reason I came to it was closed because because you obeyed the government as, as, as faithfully as you by your love, love for your neighbor. And because of that incredible love displayed in really distancing and, and not, not coming together corporately to worship Christ, I was Jesus' Lord. It's just, it's not going to happen. Yeah. And so because we kept our church open, brought people to Christ, and, and that's what you would expect you are heralding and proclaiming the gospel at every opportunity. Yeah, I think, I, but there was uh, one that was affected by the initial close down that we did that took her, I think a few months to get done to her spiritually. Um, but our, our people were, were kind of meeting, mm. <laughs> uh, not all, they're meeting in, in groups and, uh, and doing that. Are. so but yeah, yeah it, it, it affected some people for sure and i think some of the children as well it was yeah affected. for sure uh that's an interesting illustration yeah nobody's going to say you know because i saw such devotion by shutting down <laughs> and not having church i mean i i came to christ because you were doing that yeah it's not it just doesn't make sense that doesn't add up so it's a good way of putting it um okay so 
And, and through that, you said you kind of covered my next question of like the positive things that came out of it. Um, and there were people that came to know the Lord because you stayed open because uh, you and they probably saw you on the news. In fact, so, you know, your light uh, was shining that much brighter because everything became that much dimmer and darker and everybody could see it for what it really was. It was an opportune time for the church to shine. And the churches that didn't really miss the boat to to show their separation between that the darkness and the light of Christ um, that they're gathering to, to worship, you know. So, um, yeah, it's fascinating how that worked out and how the Lord uses an evil thing, you know, for his good like that and to build his church. It's fascinating. Um, we talked about growth we didn't necessarily get into numbers how much has your church grown as a result of the stand you took yeah i mean it's almost tripled in size like we we were i'm losing track now but i think we were on a sunday as an annual average prior to our battle with COVID 19 up to my imprisonment those numbers were creeping up and so i think we were over four or at one point, uh, but now we have Sundays. Uh, we haven't yet cracked a thousand, but we've come. We've, we've had a number of services over, over nine hundred. Uh, um, oftentimes, you know, eight fifty. I'm just definitely growing numerically, and we're limited because we're in two services at this point in time. I'm sure our our our, our Sunday service format. That it's unlikely we're going to grow that much. Uh, building a bigger auditorium and being able to, to house more folks. So I think our, our oh, just because the way that we're currently set up discourages numerical yeah. growth. But um, our church, I mean, we, it's been amazing just, just as an aside. Like we, right from the get-go, had people going through FOM all over the place. So fundamentals of the faith, really working through our doctrinal statement. So we had them coming in. I mean, I mean, think of the size of our church, and we've got like 60 people in FOF, you know, right now. And and, uh, and so that's been huge, huge in terms of bringing people in for theological traditions and getting them firmly rooted in the scripture. It's been amazing. Wow, that's awesome. Um, so why do you think Christians see the government as well i shouldn't say it so blanketly obviously some christians don't see the government as neutral but why do you think some christians see uh the government as neutral that um especially before the lockdowns um i think that was just kind of the tendency to kind of think that that was off limits yeah i've thought about that a little bit and it's tough why that is i know in the midst of it interacting with some of the folks in our church who, that at worst the government was neutral right i mean in some cases they were you know, good right. and um and in some cases the government is good but but to just be to, to the government being good uh, inherently good across the board is problematic i i, I thought you know there's something about the doctrine of total depravity here that's not, not being implicated in this conversation somehow we're not letting our soteriology to, to impact the way we see the government and at the same time you're puzzled because side christianity if you think about the, the unbelieving world typically there's a, a government I, I mean rebellion against authority is just built into the human condition and so that even the world would have been far more rebellious against the government in this case and, and the answer for that I removed God from the equation in effect they're left with the state as God and therefore time the state is so um, pandered to their their needs and persuaded that they're, that they're left to comply but as far, as far as the Christian I think it comes down to the total depravity and under heart and 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 then even even just thinking through the world system 
system and Satan and the, the, the whole world lies in his hands. I mean, uh, you know, thinking through even that, uh, Satan is clearly at work in and through government. Clearly. I mean, you'd be a fool. And so I think there's even some of that built into the equation as well, just failing to understand uh, that they taking place at the level of the governing authorities. Yeah. Which is on display far more clearly now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting how when you don't, you know, when an unbeliever doesn't fear God, how naive they become about humanity and what humanity really is. And their anthropology is so far off. And you expect that for an unbeliever, but for a believer, you would you'd hope that the anthropology is better than that. But, you know, um, uh, and I, I think that's dead on. You have to, they have to become lax in that area and have not meditated on the truths of uh, total depravity in, in order to just turn around and then trust the government like that. Um, so uh, there are some Christians, and maybe some Christians think that that's what we're doing when we make this documentary, but there's some Christians that think that we're trying to build a Christian nation. Um, and, um, there is some tension there because, you know, in a way, those folks that believe that are wanting to build a Christian nation probably would really love this, this movie. Um, they would see it as very, you know, proactive. Um, and, but at the same time, that's not our motive in doing it. We're not necessarily, we're not trying to build a Christian nation. We're just, we're just trying to be faithful. And I think I just answered your question, but, um, so I undermined my own question by not shutting up. <laughs> but I'll ask you anyways. We like <laughs> um, so uh, what do you what do you think what do you think about that? Tell me about the Christian building a Christian nation versus what we're doing, which is not, but why can we say it's different and what makes it different? Well yeah, so I, I think part of the question Christian nationalist and then part of the answer is I mean, who knows? What what does that even mean? I mean, being defined early on when we took the stand that we did, the mainstream media was calling me a Christian nationalist. I think I was called a Christian nationalist <laughs> uh, just by, by virtue of the stand that we took, which I understood that, that basically mean that, that I was one who wanted to hold on to our Judeo-Christian mm. world as a resistor to shifting away, away from the Christian judeo uh, world in that sense i might be a christian nationalist because i i certainly as i follow christ and obey him in every sphere of my life i i certainly want that to translate into you know resistance in the relates to the eroding of, of of the foundation and fabric of, of western civilization which i think is but that's not my aim and my goal. That just ends up being a, um, a peripheral implication of the Christ. But, um, yeah, I think at the end of the day, we, we just want to glorify the Lord for glory. And so as these opportunities arise, as these battles come with the governing authorities, that's a, a phenomenal of Christ on display. And so that's, we want to seize on those moments. Number one, to bring glory to him, give him the glory he's due. Number two, to, to, to win people to Christ. We want, and, um, and ultimately, we realize, too, that as the unbelieving world rejects the light, then they're just increasing the judgment for the day of judgment. So, so yeah, I think that... that, uh, that. Yeah. So, um, question uh, for you, Aaron, and then James. Um, how surprised are you that Canada has gotten where it's at so quickly in its, I guess, pathway to totalitarianism is what I would call it. You can correct me if I'm wrong. But um, yeah, how surprised are you about how your government is behaving and has behaving over the last decade or so? I think I was surprised that they put James in jail. Yeah. <laughs> to go to the lengths to do that so that we we wouldn't gather, but I don't think I was surprised of our nation. And, and you know, there are things like, 
like abortion. There's no abortion laws. Abortion is a great area. We have huge pride parades. So um, decades ago. Um, so when you, you look, look at all of that stuff and, and, and you went towards like a socialist government, um, it, it didn't really surprise me how fast it came with the virus and, and putting James in jail. You know, like I was training my, you know, persecution is going to come in your lifetime, but probably not my lifetime. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was just to what is going to happen as it keeps unraveling especially with the gender ideology and critical it wasn't it was surprising but wasn't surprising yeah. it's kind of my answer yeah <laughs> yeah how about you james say, yeah i would say the the speed at which it's taking place right now is pretty surprising mm -hmm. the the pace between even just the end of covid let's say now and and how how, how much traction the governing authorities call it satan like the demonic realm has has really uh moved in implementing a, a clearly satanic ideological agenda and uh and surprising that in saying that there is some benefit if we could speak somewhat about the moment that we're in because if you look at your country for example it's evident that the left is has gone yeah. too far. Well, they're pushing back, yeah. which in some ways, even though we wouldn't endorse some of the ways they are put, we, right. we, we would like to see society push back on this a little bit. And I, uh, uh, my wish, I, 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 I'm reluctant to say hope because my hope is in Christ. My wish is no re reveals his colors more, more and more and more with how to tyrannical his leg is that, that it's going to actually wake up even his his own, own voters to go like not what we're talking about when we vote liberal and yeah. and, and and that through through that will end up being you know, you know how long him being out will be a benefit i don't know but at this point in time anything but true to be will be a step in the right direction so yeah so yeah we'll see it's been a great it's it's moving that might be the Achilles heel of the whole thing at least for you know a bit of before right. you know things continue to progress the way they are and I, I say that like my expectation is that things will prepare because it's clear we're under the judgment of God God, God has handed over our nations and and but a return to worshiping the one true God in Christ and therefore but for a mass people coming to Christ. There's there's no turning this thing around. Yeah, that's right. I, I mean, this thing is going off a cliff. So I do ex expect it to progressively get worse based on on the fact that this is the wrath of God. Yeah. But we say that with great, great optimism. <laughs> yeah, optimism, <laughs> optimism that Christ can return at any moment. Yeah. And at, at which point he is going upon the earth earth climaxing in his, his second coming and the establishment of his kingdom which would be a curve i mean that yeah. is, is as optimistic as it gets yeah that's right We're, we have the best optimism the very best um yeah you know it's interesting because you can be optimistic about it in the sense of okay say you know, this is a graph and we're going down, we're spiraling down and things are getting darker and darker and we push back and we kind of go back up a little bit, but then it just comes down and keeps going down and down and you do this on the way down and we get optimistic about the wrong things. And I mean, that's not a bad thing. Like the byproduct of what you just said, if there was a revival or something like that, you would have that pushback. Um, but society is going to continue to do what it does when they lay in the lap of Satan. And, um, and we can't get so caught up in in the results of that. It's just being faithful and focusing on the true optimism of Christ's return. Um, so, great. Um, you know, one of the things that did happen in your, uh, what do you call it, province? Alberta's a province, right? Sorry. I'm, I need to go back to school. Um, <laughs> province Alberta is you did push back, and there was a change in the guard politically 
How much do you think the church had an influence in that or the fact of you standing and going to jail? Yeah, I think it's been significant. Um, so the, we had a conservative and, and the guy that was the premier, so our, our governor effectively, um, had like a Trumpian like figure, you know, to be a, a, a Christy Noam, a, a Ron DeSantis. It was like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. I mean, one moment he would just say all the right things and be the powerhouse can flip. And you think like, like whoa, we've got like, you know, uh, Justin Trudeau governor. So, yeah. Um, so anyway, there's no question. So he didn't survive COVID. COVID killed Kenny. And uh, so <laughs> Premier Kenny is, uh, is no longer around. He had to step down, down was replaced. The woman is now Danielle Smith. She's our premier and she's very sympathetic to our stand the pastors in our province um a particular group of pastors in our province that the government has church and and so yeah it's been positive in fact our provincial government's even now saying the federal government's always trying to tell alberta what to do and alberta is really significant in canada because we've got all the potential to be incredibly prosperous and of course the the, the federal government doesn't like prosperity so they want to well now our government is saying no to the federal government in the past what would happen is that the the federal goes some, some kind of legislation on alberta and then we comply but then we put it into the court system and wait and nothing would ever come of it well now we're saying no no we're saying no to the federal government now they, they have, so we're going to be in non-compliance as well it's in the court system and the courts can work it out and I think we're doing that mm. because of, of what we showed them, and and, uh, and so e even some of the even some of the the I guess the MLAs who were the aggressors against the church actually started saying no to the federal government on certain firearms legislations and stuff like wow. that. A, a positive sign too. Yeah. And um, so yeah, I think I think the impact is significant. Lasting that impact is politically, I have no idea, right. but in the short term, it made a difference for yeah, sure. Interesting. And I've made church history a big part of this documentary, which you haven't seen yet. You're going to see soon on the, uh, at our premiere, by the way, it airs on, or it goes out into the theaters July 28th. And we've got a ton of theaters that are interested. Cinemark has taken it, um, which, uh, is awesome. They, they saw the film and they loved it and they like, we want it in our theaters and we're going to be in Regal theaters across the U.S. and it's growing. We're getting more and more theaters and we'll have more towards the, uh, towards the, the opening night, which is July 28th. So if you want information on that, go to EssentialChurchMovie.com, EssentialChurchMovie.com. Put your email in there. If you're watching this, you probably already did. But if somebody else watches it after this is put out on the Internet and you're watching this right now, you can go to EssentialChurchMovie.com. And uh, learn all about where these theaters are. And you can go and buy a ticket and see it in a really good venue. And um, I've had the opportunity to see it in the theater. Um, and it's way better than seeing it on TV, let me tell you. I've seen this more than anybody on the planet because I'm the writer-director. And uh, I've seen it in multiple venues from an iPhone to a TV, to a bad TV, to a good TV, to a nice theater. And let me tell you, theater is where, it at, where it's at. We need to have theaters make a comeback. Um, anyway... Back to the political ramifications of the church taking a stand. I involved church history in this documentary, um, and I weave it throughout, and it has this um, really uncanny parallels to the things that we went through, um, that they went through in the 1600s. Uh, I landed in the 1600s, and the reason I landed in the 1600s is because that's when the Covenanters came about. And the Covenanters... Um, are the Scottish people, Scottish believers, who took a stand, and they're called covenanters because they made a covenant, a national covenant. And in our statement, Christ, uh, not Caesar, that the church came out with, um, they voted on July 23rd. They put it out July 24th, 2020. Um, in that statement, it referenced them. So when I started researching this, what I would put in this film, I started researching all them, and there's amazing stories in there. And I kind of go through the whole century. But do, through that research and making this film, it dawned on me how um, 
the church, when it really does what it's supposed to do, the byproduct of that in society is uh, exponential. And as I learned about the covenanters and what they were, those Christians had to flesh out the idea that we were dealing with. But they did it, you know, 350 years ago or whatever, um, of why they can say to the government, no, we're not going to do that. And here's why, because we actually have a biblical principle and it's in the Bible and we can we can rest on that and say, no, we can defy you when it comes to this. And that's exactly what they did. Some many to their death. And. Then America comes around after the 1600s, right, 1776, and you have that stand and these Christians fleshing out these concepts. And I used to say, you know, well, of course, you know, America was, you know, built on Judeo-Christian ethics, worldview. But when I started studying this, I started realizing it wasn't just that. It was this fleshing out of it where they really made it clear and it was fresh in the people's minds, even if they weren't a believer at that time. And it influenced them. And the design of America, I believe, you can attribute to the church. For sure. Now that I've studied this and the stand that they took on those truths and this concept of separation of church and state, is it comes from the Bible. Which is ironic to me because an atheist will go to you know, a courthouse and say, we need to take down that statue of the Ten Commandments or the statue of the Bible or whatever. And I'm thinking, because of the separation of church and state, and I'm thinking, that's the only reason you know what that is. <laughs> it's the thing you're taking down. is the reason you even have that concept. So, uh, yeah, it's fascinating to me. So, you know, in our context, so I'm just saying, like, it's true. It's true in history, and it's true now. You took a stand, and you received the, the brunt of the persecution, way more so than we did. And because you were faithful through that, there is not only fruit for that for the church, but there is this, I believe, this influence in society that human beings thrive because of the influence of the church. Um, anyways, that my teaching session is over. That was my little my sermon. Um, it was excellent. <laughs> okay, good. Um, all right, so where are we at here? Um, yeah, how do you think, based on that trial, that you went through, how do you think it's prepared you guys for the future? And I'll answer, answer that personally, but then answer about your church. Because really, you know, we focus on you, but your church as a whole stood faithful well. It wasn't just you. It was your congregants who went to church. And while you were in jail, continued to go to church because they believed in the same thing. And it's not just one man. It's it's the church body that was being faithful at Grace Life in that local area and, and in Tim Stevens area in Calgary and in Los Angeles for us. But tell us how, I forgot what my question was. Oh, the future. How did that prepare you and your church for the future? Can you speak to that? Real quick, like we could have opened our doors as a leadership and if no one had come, we never would have been mine, right? right? So we... We had the congregation played a critical role in my imprisonment because if worship Christ, then it, it, nothing would have happened. Um, so your point is is well made. What it's done is it's forced us to go through some testing to see what Christ, and and then to come out the other end of it and and see that God causes all things and they're called to put into His purpose. So we can look at Romans 8, 28 in the context of that kind of suffering and see that it's it's true everywhere. God causes all things to work together for, for our good. So I think I think I think it's helped us to detach from the world a little bit. So, you know, even as we see everything loosely, when you go through testing where you really have to be open handed with it all, because it could it all be taken and you can go yeah, I want Christ more. I want his glory more. Christ is worthy. I think that's helpful. So I think what it does is it it, um, it, it upon which you can you can then go into the next battle. Now, in saying that, let me just say this. I was in prison a little shell-shocked. Like, I, I needed a little bit to, 
to sort of rebuild the the desire and conviction again. And uh, and so I came out a little bit shell shocked, and so I got out of jail March twenty one. It wasn't really until fall twenty twenty one September that I had the battle. It took some time to to um, to be willing to do that, and, and the Lord was gracious in that to give me a bit of reprieve and uh, and to to allow me to be strengthened. And in the meantime, he raised raised up Tim Stevens to kind of, kind of pick up the baton and, and, and take the, and, uh, and that was really helpful too for, for me to, to, to just reinvigorate me to, I, th- I think it's, it's built a foundation upon which to, to, to obey Christ at all costs and ask us from the things of this world all the more so that the cost doesn't seem as great um, in light of, and so I, I think that's significant. And I think that same reality applies to the church i mean dealt with the theology of it so we'll be able to see this from a mile away next time yeah so there won't be fusion of what do we do um, um you know we 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 have nicely carved lines to, to to this next time it comes about whatever the the means by which it comes about and so and and, and then i think it's 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 prepared people the same way our, our congregation had the face cost, experience sacrifices, where some lost their job for various reasons as a result of this time, and yet landed on biding for them, in some cases, more so than he was previously. And so um, I think in the exact same way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, one thing that I thought, and I'm sure you can attest to this as well in your church, is I feel like my church is more united than it's ever been. It's more like-minded than it's ever been because well, everybody that disagreed left. <laughs> so you got it. And everybody that agreed came. So we like <laughs> our church grew and they all are more like-minded. So uh, I noticed that. I'm sure that's the same in your church as well. Yeah. 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 I think like there has been some tension that's revolved around thinking through the Lordship of Christ and authority and, and how that can kind of, Local discussions concerning the kingdom, and and so there has been a little bit of tension in our context around from that. Um, we, yeah, we have a very united church, a very healthy, loving church. Awesome. Well, at uh, this time, I'd like to open up some of the questions. Um, I see this thing going over here. I haven't paid attention to it, but I imagine <laughs> the people uh, are will tell me what I'm supposed to ask here. Um, are there any new questions from the uh, folks out there? What am I looking? Which computer am I looking at? This one. Um, uh, where are we? So, which one am I supposed to look at? To the right here. We can see one on, on the screen right now. Oh, did any of the members face jail time and/or fines for meeting? Is that what? Yeah, that's where it's at. Okay, now I know where to look. I'm new to this. Um, okay, yeah. Did any of your members face jail time and or fines for meeting? In fact, at various points that they might be, be fined for attending church and missions. So no, we, you know, the, the, the RCMP threatened to find one point, but never, never did. So they, they, they certainly had to come to church not knowing what could happen. They faced jail time i don't think so um no, no they didn't <laughs> none, none, uh, none all. okay no, no it, it was the the attack was pretty so even when james went to jail and i always say that my that our associate bro and he'll kill me for saying that but that's okay mm-hmm. um because, because he stood up in that pulpit and he preached um uh, they left us alone the entire time. Like they were sitting across the street and saying, "Oh, we're here." Uh, I never sought to come on the pro- property, so the attack was pr- pretty targeted to James during that time. So, in the second in time, I turned myself in. I was brought before a justice of the peace and and uh, execution, which we call the crown because they represent the crown. 
um, as she was in her right in my case in my he hearing um, she she said the, the reason put him in jail is because if we take him out the church will stop meeting the justice that's true so so he he, he he was wise enough to realize that no this church is going to meet with him. and that's why he actually uh, brought up about my release it's just that when he released me he I had to agree to, which would be that I would comply with the public health act. And so had I ceased and held church the following Sunday, I would have violated my bail condition, yeah. which is like a whole. So, yeah. um, and, and also a lack of integrity. If I'm going to say, I'm going to comply with something sure. and not do it. That's why I ended up in a jail is, is because I refused to sign that, that condition. Yeah. But, um, um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No, it was targeted. <laughs> yeah, and that's an interesting thing. And, and also in church history, it's, well, it's targeted. It's targeted, but also back then, like in the 1600s, they went out, they started going after everybody um, towards the end there. Um, and, and maybe that's our future. Um, that it won't just be targeted, but it'll be all of us. Um, so we got another question here. I'd love to know what Pastor Coates hopes this movie accomplishes for the kingdom good question well yeah so i think if there are, are churches out there that, that are still sort of um agnostic or just you know think that complying was the right stance or a hump like we just need to come to the place where we can all go like all right whether we him should have been open we've got to, this needs to be nailed down We've got to be able to move forward from here with this that, that it's persuasive for people who are either on the fence because I really think that if the church of Christ, the true church of Christ is going to be effective in the years ahead, this, this has got to get ironed out. And I think it'd be interesting to get your take on this because... For instance, I know back with um, the Second World War that there was some resistance among the churches who were calling for churches to defy the governing authorities, but there were these compliant churches. And I wonder if that's just held true oftentimes throughout these battles. And you've been looking at that. I think that there's got to be a, a persuasion. A, a persuading of these folks. Yeah. Um, I suppose you're asking me because of the church history aspect that you're saying is, was that church true back in the day in, in my study? Well, yeah. Is this a, yeah. a reoccurring thing? Yeah. I, I, I don't, you know, the reformation was still kind of fresh in everybody's minds. And if you were a Protestant, um, you were, putting your life on the line pretty much from the beginning. So I think the church was pretty pure back then. I could be wrong. Somebody's going to, I'm not a church historian. I just studied what I studied. But um, I would say that it probably was more faithful churches or faithful Christians in the 1600s out of the true church than um, probably what we observed. That's my guess. Um, um, the Christ and uh, what is it? Um, Two thousand years of answers that question. That it is, is like even just reading the first book that it is consistent that um, um, uh, comply and others defy, and that's been a consistent yeah. early church now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure, there was differences as far as like the percentages. I don't know, like more ma majority or minority. Like was the ma majority of the churches. Um, you know, not disobeying the government. There definitely was during the Great Ejection a split on that, and there were definitely people who, uh, you know, there were men who left their pulpits um, because they were not going willing to compromise and let the the Book of Common Prayer regulate their worship, which was handed down to them by the monarchy, the state essentially. And um, when they refused to do that. Some other people didn't refuse because they said, well, some of the things that they're asking us um, is amoral. 
okay, so I have to cross myself. It's not a sin to cross myself. Or I have to kneel versus standing or stuff like that. And so they'd say it's amoral. It's not that big of a deal. But I don't think the people, I think that they were probably true. A lot of true believers that still thought that way would say that they're not believers. Um, but, you know, uh, over 2,000 of them were ejected from their pulpits. And um, that's a whole lot back then. So uh, anyway, we got another question here. Uh, what do we got? Were you afraid of the government in any way? Well, I think, yeah. I mean, I think in the con going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the governing authorities and them having all of the power in an earthly sense, being, being in a sense at their mercy, recognizing God's sovereign. Um, yeah, they, going to jail moments for sure for me. And, uh, um, you know, I deal, I deal Detail that in, in the book God, which if you haven't got that copy, you should get. Mm. Um, but uh, um, really heavy moments where, where I had to digest whether I was willing to go to jail to keep our church open and and, and physiologically challenging to go, go through those moments. And the Lord, Lord carried me. I mean, were, were, were there moments of fear? Absolutely. We obviously. Um, the fear of the left. And yeah. so I was able to, to deny one fear and, and walk um, by the grace of God. But there's no question it was not easy. Yeah. It brings me back to the movie because, in, um, you know, I couldn't put everything in your story in there. And when you finally see the documentary, you'll see how much I had to actually leave out. And I apologize. Um, but, you know, the main points are there. Or it would be like six hours long. Um uh, but, you know, the the moment where you have that, um, that, you know, it physically had an impact on you, it emotionally had an impact on you, and that you definitely were feeling it, the burden of it, and uh, that's definitely in the documentary. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm sure I'd feel the same way, going to a maximum security prison and you don't know when you're going to get out. Um, maximum security prison sounds like a horror movie to me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to go there. Um, all right. Do we have another question? What is the passion behind you standing firm in your convictions? Hard to answer, but, but I think, um, you know, theology and doctrine is uh, um, it's somewhat it's not um, you can't can't feel it and touch it but these are beliefs that we have what you believe theologically has to translate into how you live isn't there's a, a, a serious disconnect one of the things that i wonder about, about those who would disagree is they may be content to have sound theology and dockies accurately with Without really thinking through, living out the implications of that theology, I think just you know, as a as a shepherd of the sheep in the context of a local church, a plethora of moments where you are brought to a fork in the road where either God's word is going to be the to, to dictate how it is you're going to respond to a given set of circumstances, or it's not not that you know. By God's grace, He's He's given me the desire to obey Him in those blesses that obedience, and that that just goes further to to, to shape um, and, and and yeah, what's up? Pause on that thought. One, I, we're going to lose them on Instagram, correct? It, probably right mm -hmm. now. So if you want to continue, you can watch us on Facebook. And where's the other place? Facebook and uh, YouTube, YouTube and Twitter, YouTube and Twitter. So we're live on those feeds. So if you want to find us on there and you lose us on Instagram, you can go to those three feeds, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook. OK, sorry. Continue. And uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I just want to get that in before it cuts out for Instagram people. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, what is the passion? It's got to be cry perfect man. Like I, 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 um, I obviously like everyone battle with the. The flagging for for greater Christ likeness and obedience in my life, but but there's the watershed moments where 
it's very clear what it is that I'm supposed to do. It's essential that you obey the Lord in those moments. And as you do that, it, it does feed passion to, to stand firm. And, um, and oftentimes, too, just for the record, I mean, sometimes all you have to do is stand firm. Like, just think about that for a minute. Mm. Like, all you have to do is stand and then graciously stand there. And, and and appeal to God, God as your defender. All you have to do. Yeah. It's not necessarily always this offensive, you know, or action that's required. No, you just have to stand exactly where you're supposed to stand, and and instruct to, to God who is faithful. So, yeah. um, I think that can be really really helpful in in uh, be immovable. Yeah. Yeah, it's all in the power of Christ. Yeah, go ahead, Aaron. Yeah, but your union with Christ, um, he died for me. And I I can't, but you, you keep that in your view that he sacrificed his life to regenerate my heart and make, I have to do this for him out of his love for me. And, and I love him in return. So when you keep the cross and resurrection, it's that that's where you, that's where you stand. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, isn't that like the key to everything, right? We we want to focus on Christ and see everything for what it really is, is temporal and passing away and ultimately rubbish compared to Christ. And we're constantly wanting to cultivate that in our lives more and more. So we deal with all, not just we deal with our sin the right way. We deal with one another the right way. We deal with challenges like this the right way. Um, and it corrects our motives, right? Because then it becomes all about Christ and it's not about us and and. So I, and I don't know, we'll just let me express this. You know, like the government was being a bully. The government was trying to bully. Yeah. Uh, bully me, bully us, bully society, bully the sense in which as a church, we stood up against a bully. Yeah. bully. And, and times where, like, who doesn't want to stand up against a bully? Right. Everybody hates a bully. <laughs> and, and so, yeah. Yeah, there's a sense in which we just stood up to a bully and and, um, and yeah, to a bully. Um, yeah. yeah, you know, they acted like a bully in, in the way a bully does on a schoolyard, too, is because a bully will try to convince everybody that you're the worst. And they don't like this guy. You should not like this guy. This guy's a jerk. You know, you, you, this guy's not cool. Um, and the narrative was that, right? Like the propaganda that's put out, you know, about us is just like ridiculous but that's what a bully does is they create propaganda about the person that they're bullying and bullies hate when you stand up to them yeah they do yeah they do <laughs> yeah okay we got another question here james how would you encourage the other churches in canada should this happen again well yeah i think there's just got to be a stand, a, a lane that be for Christ, that churches who are faithful would come together, stand together. Um, God's called us to be. And so um, the word that we live, it has, has to have its reign in the life of the church, in our lives personally. And so there needs um, a conviction that God's word is sufficient and we're going to go to god's word for and 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 build our lives upon that foundation that rock so uh i think i think churches need to, to seize opportunities to glorify for everything and, and i think those opportunities are going to come and be a light oh, like yeah. for you to shine for christ and to share the gospel and um, like we so bright by the third lockdown, they were like, "Stop giving attention to them," because we were meeting, and they were even meeting, so they were keeping us out of the media. There was no cops, no nothing, so they were like, "Stop giving them attention." Yeah, let me yeah. just say, like, so, so, um, what we went went through was definitely strategic, mm -hmm. like the way the media was being used and everything else. Um, even like, you know, I've heard, 
her, her health updates and the questions that were asked about, about our church and all of that. All of that did manufactured. It was intentional. And, and so they were at strategically. And then when they re realized that this is not going well, we, we got to stop, stop giving. It's like, stop talking. Media stopped talking. Everyone stopped talking. Government wouldn't shine the light on what we were doing. The charade. It was all, it was all um, intentional, yeah. and um, understand that. Yeah. Shadow banning my social media. Yeah. Hey, we're still here. We're right. still meeting. Why are you pretending? Yeah. <laughs> wow. That was really cool. Well, thank you for coming on and talking with me. I really appreciate it. Um, we are so thankful for you guys and your church as you stood up to the bully not out of rebellion or pride, but because of your loyalty to our King Christ. Um, and uh, that's the, the best reason to stand up. Um, so we're so thankful for you and doing that. I'm so glad I got to go up there and get to know you guys and interview you and spend a week up there doing some filming and then to go down and visit with Tim Stevens, uh, it was just fantastic. And it really ministered to me for sure. And um, I think the movie is is better for it. Um, the movie is not uh, what it could be without you. So you guys really complete the story because you give us the the global aspect of the church in that moment. It's impossible for me to go to every church on every continent, but if you think about it, the church globally was shut down, and that's the first time, as far as I know, in history that that has occurred, and that was very interesting. And so you guys represented that angle of the story for us, for the global aspect, and, and showed us the stakes, the stakes that are really out there. I mean, that, those stakes were for us, too, but we had a hedge around us, it seemed, and that what happened to you wasn't going to happen to us, and we, we recognized that at some point. Like, but when we saw what was happening to you guys, I mean, you can't tell this story without you guys. So I'm so thankful that you're willing to tell it. And uh, that you're coming down and you're going to see it. And I'm going to get to see you in, in person. And it's going to be awesome. So I'm looking forward to that. So we're premiering it at Grace Church on 23rd. But the big date is July 28th. July 28th is going to be in theaters. This is the first ever, I think, theatrical release that Grace Community Church has ever done. So it's exciting to be the director of that and God's sovereignty in hand and like putting that in my lap. It's kind of amazing. Um, and uh, to be a part of that and to work with such a great team and it's such a great group of creative people to collaborate with. And, and we really poured our, our hearts and our creative souls into this thing and just made it the best we could. And um, uh, I'm sure you're going to enjoy it when you come down here. Um, so anyway, thanks again. We're signing off for the Essential Church. comes out July 28th. If you have questions, sign up at EssentialChurchMovie.com. If if you want to want this movie to be spread out and to snowball, please share with your friends on social media. It has the gospel in it, so you can use this as an evangelistic opportunity for your friends and family that don't know the Lord and invite people to the theater. And it will give you a platform to share the truth of our King to them. So thanks again, and uh, good night. Thank you.